This video is to do a quick run through of how to get started with your project. And I like to do these videos every year. I found students learn by example a lot better with Altium than, than going to like a curriculum of lessons. So usually showing people how to use it uh, works the best. One downside though is as you're watching this, if you're a student, try not to exactly follow everything I do. A lot of students get a little too prescriptive and they just kind of do it like a cookbook. Um, so I'm going to deliberately break these videos up. I'm going to kind of do one piece that's going to be unlike what you're going to do for your project. This first video is going to be sort of getting things started, getting things set up, and then it's going to be um, how to some details about USB. So USB and using USB connectors for power is there's some details that aren't really covered in the class, and so I'm going to, I'm going to do that here as well. But just just to say, if you try to follow exactly what I do, it's probably not going to end up. Um, what you want. So for instance, in this video today, I'm going to be using all three USB connectors. You're just going to want to choose one, but I'm just trying to go over some details of, of how to implement these things. So to start, I have Altium open, and I'm going to create a project and load the libraries for it. I did this in the last video, but I get to do it over again. So two-layer PCB project. Again, that's a good check to make sure that we have the the R drive mapped with all this. So if you're just starting, you've already created a project, always be sure you're operating in the project. Always be sure if you're editing a document that the project is open. One of the things I don't like about Altium is if you have a project open and you close Altium, and you reopen Altium, the files that you had open in that project will still be present as free documents. And if you edit them that way, it will change the files, but it won't do the, it won't make the associated changes to the project documents that are associated with them. So it's really risky. We've had a lot of students lose a lot of work because they edited documents that are saved as free documents. If that happens to you, though, come and contact me. There's usually ways that uh, we can get around it. So usually we can sort of migrate those updated changes into the project anyway. So so don't throw away hours of work because that happens. Contact me and we can try to find a way to fix it. So now that we open this, we open this document up. First thing I'll do is set some of these title things. If you're working on your design as a group, you can put multiple names on the schematics. Ultimately, you're going to each individually have to do your own Altium board layout and design. But a lot of you, if you're working on a team, your project is going to look fairly similar. So it's OK if there's multiple names on a schematic. Just note that you will ultimately be graded based on the quality of the schematic you submit. So if you're working with a group and some people are like, yeah, that's good enough, and you're sort of like, yeah, I want to make sure that everything is grid aligned and I want to clean this up and make it look a little bit easier to read, a little bit nicer. It's okay. So, and, and if you're a member of a group and somebody says that, hey, no offense, I want to take this and, and improve it a little bit because I want to do everything I can to get a better grade. You know, be, you know everybody's, everybody's different. So, so that's totally fine to do. Save date 11 to. I apologize too because I got. Like no sleep last night. I was up till four a.m. writing these personnel committee letters. So I, I, I uh, might be a little delirious in this video. Sorry about that, but I'd rather get it out. I'd rather have a video for you. So what should we call this thing? So, any plain. So the only thing it didn't update is the sheet title, and like in the last video, the reason sheet title is not with the others is because it's possible to have multiple.
So we got all that updated. Now I want to make sure there's those libraries that I talked about in the Canvas course. So we're going to add those libraries so we make sure we have access to them. So I'm going to go, oh, I don't see libraries here. I'll put on the side tab. So that's why they might be hidden by the video, but I want to click panels and go to, oh, oh, sorry. Maybe it's going to find. Yeah, I'm already losing my mind. Maybe that book is going to help. So if you look at, so miscellaneous devices, so the WWE schematic library that is saved in the preferences is automatically linking. The miscellaneous devices and connectors, those come from Altium. So we're going to have to add silk soap ones for this project. I like to install them here. You can associate them with the project here. Um, I'll be honest, I don't fully know the, to, to my understanding, the project libraries are, these are libraries that you specify as being associated with your project itself, whereas the installed libraries are ones that Altium says these are Altium. So if you started a new project, these Altium ones would be associated with it. The project ones wouldn't necessarily, but I'm not fully sure that's correct. So. Um... So if, if this is on your computer, a lot of times um, this by default goes to integrated libraries, in which case you're not going to see these files. So you have to change it to all installable libraries or to all files in order to even be able to see these show up, just to show you. Normally, by default, when you're trying to load a library, it just looks like that. So make sure to change it. I'm going to select them both. And then it's tempting to hit the install button. It's a little confusing because usually you click an install button and you think, oh, it's going to do something, but it's already installed. So now if we go to this drop down menu. We can now see this new part of the script class. This video, I'm only going to do the USB. So I'm going to talk about the three different types of USB, add all of them to the project. So my device will have three USB connectors. That's a bad design choice in general. You're going to want to have one. If you have multiple USB connectors, the way my design will work, it will technically be capable of accepting any of the three. The problem is if, people, if for some reason somebody connected two at the same time, it could create an issue. So what I'm going to design is not going to be safe to, to produce as an actual consumer product. If you wanted to have multiple USB inputs that can power this thing, you'd have to have some sort of isolation between the inputs. So you'd have to have some way of, if you have two different inputs, rather than having them all connected to your five volt signal, you'd have to have some sort of uh, diode or transistor that's keeping those signals from, from shoving current back into the other device. So, uh, so right now I'm just going to add our three USB chargers. So this is one. Another thing to note, it's kind of hidden, but this component menu by default is minimized in Altium now. I'm not sure why. The older versions of Altium it wasn't. But it's good to be able to, to look down here and see this. We have the C type A here. USB micro. So I'll place the micro. And it looks like it's all floating around. So I'm gonna hit the G key. Make my grid a little coarse. It's really good to, to get that set that grid early because if you if you don't, um, you will be graded based on your components all being grid aligned. Grid aligning is important not just for cleanliness, it's important for making sure you have proper connections. You'll notice these are oriented two different ways, two totally different symbols. Um, some of these, some of these are parts that I made. Some of these are parts that I sort of stole. These all look completely different. Okay, so on these USB connectors, you'll notice the difference. So this USB-C has VBUS ground CC1 and CC2. So the VBUS is actually two pins, pins two and five. And the ground is two pins, pins one and six. Why are there two pins for the power and ground? There's two reasons with USB-C for that. 
One is USB-C actually has multiple power and ground connections because it's, it's capable of carrying more current on those pins. So you don't want to have too many amps of current flowing on a little tiny mini metal connection. The other thing is this is a reversible connector. The biggest difference between a USB-C connector is it can be plugged in upside down. So if you want to have two rows of pins power and ground and have them, when you flip it, maintain that power and ground connection, you're going to have to have two sets. You're going to have to have power down here and power down here and ground here and ground here. It's the only way it's going to be reversible and still maintain those power and ground connections. So that's what's happening here. There's also the CC1 and CC2 pins. These are used in the USB-C standard as a way of helping the device know its orientation. It's also used uh, so a device can identify itself and how much power it can take and, and things like that. So, so USB in general uses the resistance between signals and pins as a way of determining, it's, it's a way that it gets information about what it's being connected to other than through the data line. So the USB connection itself, the actual uh, the circuit that, that, that actually drives the USB system, it's not necessarily intelligent enough to do any sort of high level communication over the data line. So it doesn't have implemented in it some way to you know, talk to any random device that's plugged into it. And the devices that are plugged into it might not actually have that capacity. So, so we got to play some games with it. And one thing to note, there's really no good way to, there's no universally good way to power things off USB. And I'm gonna show uh, an example of that. So, so this, So this, this shows the different resistor connectors for different types of, of charge adapters. So we have the Apple charger, the Sony charger. Dedicated charger just is kind of what we're going to be doing, but um, standard USB host charging, a downstream port. So you see you have these all these resistor dividers. Um, you know, uh, one of these are provided by the host. One of, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, sometimes the pull-up resistor provided by the thing supplying power. It's a pull-down resistor by the thing consuming power. The ratio of those pr produce a voltage divider, which lets either device tell what's going on here. Um, th now, keep in mind, this is the D plus and D minus. This is on the standard USB connection. You have four connectors. You have power, ground, D plus, D minus. It's a differential pair. You don't want to play too many games with the differential pair because it has a job to do. It's got to actually, it's got to actually send data um, back and forth, and it has to send it fast. So you can't have you know, you can't have a, a, you can't play games on this data plus, data minus line. So, of course, I say that Apple and Sony do play games on the data plus, data minus line, but not in a way that's going to interfere with the transmission of data as well. This is a way of just using the line undriven as a sensing. When you're using US, a USB, standard USB connection as a dedicated charger, meaning all you want from the USB host is power. The standard way to do that is to short the D plus and D minus. So just short them together. And there's, a, there's, you know, we can, if we're building a circuit, we can just wire that short. We can just do a wire between the D plus and D minus. Sometimes to be safe, it's better to wire a zero ohm resistor. So place a zero ohm resistor between these pins, populate it with a zero ohm resistor. We have zero ohm resistors, or, you know, and push comes to shove, a zero ohm resistor is just a little wire as well. But so we're going to do this. So we're going to do this, but we'll do it with a, re, with a zero ohm resistor. So I'll go back here. So I have D plus and D minus on USB micro. I have D plus D minus on the USB A connector. So on both of these, I'm just going to place a find my resistor. If I go to components, I go to miscellaneous devices. I want to be sure to set the right footprint. So set to set three. I'm going to specify that this is a zero ohm.
I'm also going to connect to the V bus and grounds on these. So in this case, the V bus and grounds are going to be the V bus and grounds for my entire system. So I'm going to connect all of these together. Again, this is normally it is that uh, we'd only have one wire plugged in this time. But just to be clean, sort of. I didn't want that ground. I could have rotated the ground and plugged it in sideways. Usually it's good to keep the ground oriented properly. I'm going to get the V bus here. I could keep it as VCC, but as I say in the last video, I kind of like to label to, to make it clear what the actual voltage is. The USB. The data signals on, on USB connection are 3.3 volts, a differential pair, but the bus power is 5 volts. So it's something to keep in mind that any any um, system that wants to communicate on USB, even if powered by 5 volts, has to provide 3.3 volts. This has actually become a problem for devices that are 1.8 volts. So any, any device that's powered under 3.3 volts creates this issue where if it wants to use USB, it's got to bump up the power. But usually it's easy enough to just, you know, if you're connected over USB, you're going to have that five volts from whatever you're connected to. So it's usually easy enough to just, uh, you know, have a separate section of the chip that's powered by the five volts that does the conversion to 3.3. But I'm going to just remember. <clears throat> yeah, this one, USB micro has the ID pin too, which we can play games with that. I'm just going to leave it disconnected for now. That's that's. Um, an extra feature for a device to identify itself. Standard standard USB, older USB connections don't have that. Uh, okay, 5 to 0 so again, hold down shift and it makes a copy of that. Now we have this extra pin here, this is a shield pin, so normally we want to ground the shield. It's a little messy, but Now, CC1 and CC2, these pins are special for USB-C. These pins help the device orient itself. It helps the host know which direction the plug is plugged into the device. So we want to look into that. If we are using a USB-C connection just for power, what we should do is connect 5.1K resistors to ground each of these pins. Just gonna you know, space bar to rotate. Some students say do you have to capitalize the five point one K? You know, do you have to do capital K, a lowercase K, it doesn't matter. Again, the names of resistors. These are just there for our benefit. So these are just there for when we assemble this thing. Um, okay, so I've done this. I've, I think this is connected right. I'm working without a wire and without much sleep. So we'll see. So first thing I'm going to do is annotate this. I'll just. Apply. Okay. And so, you know I don't like that this thing's kind of. So move around this area. Okay. Okay. Looks good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do validate PCB project. File successful, no errors found. Oh that's good. So this is simple enough. You'll get errors later. It's a little strange. It said no errors found, but I left this pin dangling. So normally that would throw an error. I'm not quite sure how that's labeled, but just for practice, if we're trying to spe if we're trying to specify that yes, we know this pin is not connected, 
Um, we meant it to be that way. It's usually good to put one of these no DRC or no 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 ERC labels on it. So now we got that's good. Let's update our PCB. Look at that. Three USB connectors. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna put the USB connection on the left side here. There's um, no real no reason to these. I'll, I'll, pro I'll probably put the USB micro. <clears throat> probably put the USB micro in the middle just to give space. Move this side over. Grid to something. Check and see. That's pretty good. These can be really critical sometimes the position here. So sometimes the, um, I think in this case the connector actually hangs over the edge of the board. You really? Yeah. See that? The connector actually hangs over the edge of the board. So you really have to be careful with how you align it. If you had this thing back set, not on the edge of the board, that's going to cause a problem. You're not going to be able to actually make this connect. And we've had students do that where they have a USB connector further back. They don't realize it relies on hanging over the edge of the board, and then they got to play some games with it. Usually, they got like a little USB at a wonky angle in their design. So that's you know not technically aligned. There's other ways to align. I'm not going to do do it right now. I'm going to call that close enough. Keep in mind that the edge, the precision of the edge of the board cut isn't that great. I'm going to put the, the micro in the middle here. I want to be a little careful because the connectors you plug into these are often kind of thick. So, you know, the pl these plugs sometimes, this one is, is, is USB-A. It's going to go directly in the computer system. But sometimes these plugs, you know, the actual physical cable has got a fat, you know, sometimes it's got a really wide connector. I don't know if I got some around here. Yeah, like, right. So it's the USB mini. You know, look at that chungus there connected to the, you know, little connector, but huge little injection molding goober around it. So that'll bump into stuff on the side. You probably all fixed that. Uh, let's make a little more space. You also don't want these holes to be too close to the edge of the board. I don't know the exact rule, but the you know when these holes get cut, they're physically drilled. So if they're really close to the edge of the board, if they're too close, when they come through and do the final cut around the board, it'll cause problems. So this is one of the biggest mistakes that students make where the Altium doesn't catch it, but the Fab says we can't do that, is, is drill holes too close to the edge of the board. The, the boundaries of the edge of the board are something a lot of students fix. All right, I'm going to look at this in 3D and see how it's looking. I'm going to move that USB micro. Now, one thing to note with this USB micro is look at that. It's got this little lip here. This is why having good parts is really important. So that lip right now is kind of jamming into the edge of the board. So we actually have to have that sticking out a little bit. There's, I'm going to leave it as is for now because I'm going to show you a, a nifty little feature that you can do sometimes that is a different way of doing it. If you don't want to have your USB connector sticking off the edge of the board, when it's this type, where it's got a plug, there's, the, there's no way the plug is going to get past this lip of the connector. So the plug, so if the plug has a big bulky thing, it's all going to be on this side of it. So as long as that edge is near there, it should be fine. And what we're going to do is later we're going to kind of cut around this board to, to make a little indent for this thing. Okay. Now we got these resistors. Now it's pretty easy to tell, um, you know, which are connected to which just from the air wires. But one thing I like to do sometimes is go back to the schematic and see, okay, it was R1 connected here. So sometimes it's good to, to um, verify back on the schematic, which part goes where. It can help sort, the, sort this out. But again, it's not very complicated right now. So you can see the air wires. Okay. That looks good. You don't want to get too close. You know, one issue is if you're trying to solder this by hand, you're going to have to get in here with a soldering iron. And it's really tough to do on these USB connectors. You can see. 
not a lot of space in here. So it's very difficult to solder these by hand if you're not using uh, reflow. So, but the big main thing is you want to keep parts kind of far away because you're going to have to get an iron in there and it's going to be a pain. And you don't want to also deal with this. I deliberately extended out these USB-C pads. So these are, I deliberately made those longer. I thought I'd done that on the micro too, but I guess I didn't. Four. Yeah, the one thing you'll notice is the grounds have to connect to grounds and the 5 volts have to connect to 5 volts. So that will um, potentially create some issues. But now it's not. Also, my, my grid alignment doesn't have to be this fine anymore. So I'm going to switch to 25 mil and then I'm just going to bump these resistors so just to get these nice and grid aligned. Later on, I'm going to come back and shrink the size of these stations. Uh, I don't need to do it now. So in this case, the P1, uh, this this marking, it's, it's going to be useful for us for assembling. But once it's assembled, we don't really need to see it. So sometimes I'll stick it under the footprint of the part. So so we see it, place the part there, but then we're done. It's, it's not like we don't know what part goes there anyway. Yeah, there's not as much space down here. So that's all fine. So, um, okay, let's wire it up and then do the board edge. We'll see how. Let's see if we can stay on top layer. We don't need big traces here. These are signals. So this is, you know, this is going through, well, in this case, the zero ohm resistor, but there's not going to be a lot of current flowing on. Ground, so we can ground the, not all systems connect the shield to ground. There might be some times where you're doing a design where, uh, where you, where you don't want these signals connected to ground. And it doesn't really it doesn't really matter here that we ground both of these. There's well, there's a connection through the case of this, but you know there's you know there's a big metal bracket, so this is all these are already grounded. But Altium's gonna throw a fit if we don't have this. So make Altium. Some people have strong feelings about entering the sides of pads like this, like I'm doing. Sides of pad are usually fine, but coming at corners of pads, some sometimes making weird corners. There's certain process, there's certain solder processes that don't like traces at funny angles, and it can cause little goobers of things to stick in there. One common way of soldering things now is place all the parts on the board and glue them down. So you have little little microscopic needle that drops dots of glue something that places a part so everything's glued on and then the whole thing goes through a bath of solder and that's one way to do it and when that happens the solder is like physically sort of flowing over the surface of the board and things at funny angles sometimes have issues and there's you know companies that, that do that type of soldering where they're usually they're doing it because they have thousands of devices that are just being soldered very quickly and so a lot of those companies boy they have employees who spend a long time finding the best way to to get that to uh, to get that to not cause issues because even even one in a million type errors can be a problem. So so yeah, so like like this going in at a corner, some people don't like that. I'm not, I'm gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. This ground is not this ground is just this 
5.1k resistors. We don't really care about that that much. Um, the other grounds, though, even though this design is not going to carry a lot of current, the signal to ground and 5 volts is kind of important in this design. So it's pretty critical that we actually um, get a strong 5 volts out and that we get a strong ground out. We want a fat trace somewhere along here, uh, normally, if we're drawing power from this thing. So, and again, in this particular application, it's not going to end up being that important. But if you were doing something that took an amp or two amps off this, you definitely want to have a really fat trace. So you wouldn't just want to have a spindly little trace that you use for shorting this. You want to have a, a big... Okay, I don't want to do that. I'm going to have to get, I'm going to have to get this 5 volts out of here at some point. So, connect these grounds like I'll be happy. But yeah, I'm going to have to get that 5 volts out of there. I'm going to hold off on uh, You know what? Actually, no. Here's what I'm going to do. Gonna ground this resistor on the spot. Ah, uh, you might say, why did I do that? Why did I route this thing around here? One thing I definitely don't like is getting traces too close to corners. If you're soldering this by hand. And you have it sometimes sometimes I'll, I'll see students do something like this. I'll have that. And that will technically work if you're if the fab is all perfectly aligned. So technically this doesn't violate the rules, but you're pushing it. If if one issue that happens is the solder mask layer is sometimes slightly misaligned from the copper. And in, in this case, if you butt this trace up right up against the pad, it's possible the very edge of this trace will be exposed and it won't properly be masked. And then it's possible when you're soldering this to get a short between the pad and the trace. So if you don't have to, if you don't have to make it this tight, you know, space it out. Why does it have to be that far? But we're not we're not tight for space. It's okay. Okay. So now we actually can now we can get the five volts from here. So we actually can get a trap. Five volts needs to be connected internally. There's going to be a power trace, so what I'm going to do is I put that in the tab. Just that we'll do 20 mil. We don't have to get crazy. 20 mil. Connect these pads, and again, this is these pads are. One of these five volts comes from one side of the of the two rows of the USB C connectors, and the other five volts comes from the other side. And we're just connecting them together. So that's cool. So now we got our five volts. We'll bring that out. Big trace here. And we've got our ground, which so eventually I'm gonna do a ground pour for this whole thing, so the ground doesn't really matter. Um yet. But all right, let's finish up that wire and go. So this pet this trace now is fatter than this pad here, so I definitely don't want it to be that big. I want it to be big though. Get that out of there. You'll notice as we're routing, there's see there's 
one of these traces has little hash marks and the other one is just clear in the middle. That's saying that if we click, it's going to make the part that has the hash marks uh, a solid wire, but it's going to leave the other part. The other part is like, yeah, we're, we're, let's get firm on that last trace at the end of the snake here. And but the later trace, you know, you can move that around after the fact, right? So, so sometimes it's like, if I want to finish this wire, I have to click twice. I have to click once to do the hash and then once again to do the second hash. Yeah, I guess this is not, I guess the outer housing is not ordered here. I think there's a reason for that. I think I, think I changed this part. Yeah. Unshielded outside. So again, I'm not going to worry about ground right now. I'll just get this 5 volt out of here. This one. Later. I don't have to get crazy. Okay, so we got 5 volts from everything. Uh, wasn't even this ground. We'll come, we'll come back to the grounds in a later video. So now I'm going to connect all these five volts together. And again, didn't have to be this way. I mean, it shouldn't. You shouldn't actually do this for a design, because uh, if, if people connect multiple USBs, it's going to short the five volts of whatever device they're connected to. And that's the other thing. Like you don't know what this USB is coming from, so you don't know. In this case. You know, one of these could be USB power from a laptop that's just floating voltage. One of them could be USB power from a wall wart, which is grounded to earth ground. One of them could be USB from a different power supply that's floating in between earth ground and 120 volts. So there's a lot of different um, ways to generate the 5 volts or USB, a lot of different sources. Some of them are connected to earth ground, some of them are not. So connecting multiple devices, power and ground, when you don't know what they are, can be really dangerous. So in this case, we would never want to connect two at the same time. So we're mostly done here. Um, yeah, and I want to do the board cutout. So I want to show that board cutout. So again, we have this issue of we have this issue of the USB connector slicing into our board. We don't want that. So we're going to do a little notch around this. We're going to, when we do this board, we're going to put a little notch so that this USB connector is sort of sitting, sitting kind of flush with the edge, but it doesn't actually interfere with the board. Let's go back. I think all this looks good. I'm going to hit one, go back to the board define, design, redefine board. I'm going to start down here. I kind of like this edge here. This is okay. Spacebar changes the orientation of this twist, I, of this uh, corner. I like my corners to be round. So shift spacebar changes. This is 45 degree rounded corner, shift spacebar, 90 square. This is a nice rounded corner here. So, so our radius now is set to 100 mil. I kind of like that. Um, yeah, I kind of like that. I think it looks pretty good. So we'll stick with that. And stick kind of that board edge here. Now this is the connector where we wanted to play some games. So, uh, I want my grid to be a little bit finer for this.
face if it's turning in the other direction in the face bar. Again, back to 25 mil grid. I think this was about the size of the radius I had. So we're going to have to have a, a lot of board after this, so I'm just going to still leave the board big for now. We'll come back and redefine this board shape later. And again, we'll we'll come back and redefine this later. What I want to do is I want to show you what that did. So now you can see we have uh, cut out. We have this little lip here, and now the lip. It's going to sit in there, so kind of gives a little space. One thing we want to be careful though of is ultimately when this gets cut, it's going to get cut with a router bit that has a radius of 50 mil. So it might actually not even be able to make a cut this tight, and that's okay. Okay, so we're good. Next video, we will do the schematic design and we'll start to actually assemble or lay out the board assembly.